All right, I'd like to thank everyone for turning up tonight for the first in the series of talks that I'm going to be giving this year uh, through Metro Public Library on the history of the war in Vietnam, the wars in Vietnam. My name's John Foster. Uh, I'm a librarian here at Metro Public Library. I have a PhD in European history, uh, although I've studied pretty widely. And in fact, I, for a while, was a teaching assistant on the uh, Vietnam War course at the University of Washington. Uh, and I've always found the topic quite compelling. Those of you who come to the library often or attend our programs will know that I do a lot of historical programs. And I try, I have tried up to this point to mostly stay away from things that are really in living memory. And one reason for that is because it can be traumatic for people and you know, so one of the first talks that I gave when I started doing these things was about the Battle of Midway. And it turned out that a couple of the people who showed up to the talk had actually been at the Battle of Midway. And what I wanted to try and avoid at the time was, well, one of the things that characterizes the study of history is that a lot of times uh, we know things later on that we didn't maybe know at the time. And the Vietnam War is, I think, an excellent example of that. Also, I was, I have to admit, when the Ken Burns documentary came out a couple of years ago, the, the recent Ken Burns Vietnam War documentary. I was asked by one of the people running the library if I wanted to do some programming about that. And I, at the time I demurred. And the reason is just because the Vietnam War is one of the most contentious topics in the modern history of the United States. I mean, and it's, it's a wound that is still very raw. And uh, so it's something that, I didn't want to put myself necessarily in the position of telling, saying things about it to people who had actually been involved in it. But as I sort of went along, I thought that maybe there's some things that can be said about it that it would be worth, you know, all of us thinking about. And moreover, my sort of general position on this is that we need to uh, take the experiences of the people who served there seriously. I mean, I want to start out by, by thanking for the service that they rendered any person listening to this who served in Vietnam or in the armed forces generally, the country absolutely cannot survive without people willing to, to make those sorts of commitments and sacrifices. And, um, but one of the key things is to think about as we're, as we're thinking about this is uh, that the government and the, the people of the United States make a deal with the soldiers, make a deal with the, the, the people who join the armed forces. And the deal is this, you are willing to sacrifice your, your time, your efforts, your energies, and possibly your life. And the other side of the coin is that the government will not put you in a position, will not compromise you, will not put you in a position that you ought to be in. In past wars that the United States has been involved in, and World War II is the perfect example, it's the one that really defines the 20th century uh, for people in the United States. Uh, the, the sort of right and wrong of it were unequivocal. Everybody who, or practically everybody who looked at fascism thought it was a terrible system, a brutal uh, homicidal system. Hitler had clearly invaded Poland. He'd clearly invaded Western Europe. He was, he was seriously considering invading Great Britain. He would have done it if, he, if, if he'd had the boats to do it probably. By the same token, people, I think, often forget that there was a lot of opposition to that war. It was only once we were sort of in it, especially after Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor really focused people's attention in a way that, that nothing involved with Vietnam ever quite did because uh, Vietnam hadn't really attacked us. We sort of backed into the wars we'll get into a little bit later. So there are going to be four talks in this series. Uh, the next one is going to be on May the 6th. They're all going to be on Thursday nights at 6.30. And they're going to sort of, we're going to sort of deal with it sequentially. This first talk is going to deal with, I, I put in the library program guide that this is going to be 1624 to 1945. And that's, I think, a bit ambitious. What this talk is going to be is a kind of precursor talk to the other three. The, the second talk will deal with the, the French war in Indochina that pretty much started almost right at the end of the Second World War and then went into the mid-1950s. 
The third one is going to deal with the sort of beginning of the U.S. commitment in Vietnam through the Xiem regime and, and culminating in the uh, Tet Offensive, January 1968. And then the fourth and final talk is going to be about the later period of the U.S. Uh, involvement in Vietnam and the sort of winding down that happened during the Nixon administration. And what this talk is meant to do, I sort of, somebody, somebody I, was, I was talking to the other day asked me what it was gonna be about. And it's essentially, I feel like it's, it's things that the US government probably should have known before any soldier was sent into Vietnam. And that's one of the defining features of the way that we got into the Vietnam War. It wasn't like we were sort of looking around. I mean, the, the context of the Cold War is very important. This was seen as a struggle against expansive imperialistic communism. And in that respect, uh, it was not, I think, an unreasonable policy choice. I think that, you know, Stalinism and the, the system that, that succeeded Stalinism under Khrushchev and, the, and the others was a pretty terrible system. I think Maoist uh, communism was also a very, really horrific system. So from that perspective, it's, it's it's understandable why the US government would have been uh, inclined to try and defend a, a, a democratic state in Vietnam. But the United States, when it came to be in Vietnam, really knew the government and, and the people even, even more so, knew very little about what Vietnam was, where it was, what was going on there, what its history was. And these lacks of knowledge turned out to be pretty catastrophic. They weren't just the sort of thing that you may be sort of ignorant at the beginning, but then you learn on the go and then you, and then you, you can apply that knowledge. Uh, by the time we were uh, in the war, uh, 1965, when the first real major troop deployments start, US troop deployments start, we had already become part of a process and part of a dynamic that made it I am convinced, and a, and a lot of historians are convinced, a lot of military historians are convinced, made it as a practical matter, either impossible or, or you know, uh, extremely, extremely unlikely that we were gonna get any kind of positive outcome out of the situation. So what I wanna talk about today is some of the kind of prehistory of the conflict to give people a feel for uh, the history of Vietnam uh, such that it will make uh, some of the stuff that, that comes later a little more, make a little more sense. I will say too, I'm a European specialist. Uh, I, don't, I don't read any Asian languages. I wish I did. Uh, I had a really good friend, former office mate when I was at the University of Washington, who was a Vietnam specialist. And he told me at great, you know, in great detail how difficult it was to, to meet the language requirements because not only did you have to be able to uh, speak Vietnamese, but you also had to know Chinese and you also had to know uh, Manchu, which is a sort of administrative language in which a lot of the documents uh, in older Vietnamese history, especially during the time of Chinese uh, rule in Vietnam, which uh, went on and off for about a thousand years, a lot of those documents are composed in, a, in what's in, in fact a dead language, but which my, my poor friend Brad had to, had to learn to be you know, conversant in. But I do know a few sort of interesting things about about Vietnam that I will just sort of start off with and then we'll get into the, the history a little more. Um, number one, Vietnamese names, Asian names tend to sound a little odd to, to the Western ear because they tend to be monosyllabic, monosyllabic. They don't really sound like our, our names do. And that doesn't, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. They just, they're different and that's fine. That's what's interesting about Vietnamese names. I had a good friend uh, growing up who was a Vietnamese kid who had come over in the, in the 1970s. And he once told me that Vietnamese names, like if my, you know, my name is John Conroy Foster. And he said, well, in Vietnamese, your name would be Foster Conroy John. Um, so as with a lot of East Asian names, the, the family name is the first one. So No uh, Den Diem, who was the, the leader of the government of South Vietnam in the, in the 1950s and until he was assassinated in 1963, no was his family name and and you notice that all of his brothers who were also sort of powerful people in uh vietnam at the time principally his his brother no den nu who was the 
head of the sort of security operations. So No is the family name. And so they called the government, they called him Diem, and they called the government the Diem government, which is weird because it'd be like calling it the John government, except that everybody in the family, that, that's the way they sort of refer to, to people because it makes sort of more sense that way. And then that middle name, Din, D-I-N-H, a lot of times all the people in one generation will have the same middle name. So, um, so No Din Diem, his brother No Din Nu, he had four or five other brothers, one of whom was actually murdered uh, uh, in, the, in the years before the Second World War by the, or in the years, I think right around the Second World War by the, by the uh, Vietnamese communists. Uh, another thing is, so there's a lot of NG type constructions in Vietnamese words like no, which is the NG, O, which is the name of the, the family, no dead ZM. But also the, the very common Vietnamese name, uh, Nguyen, N-G-U-Y-E-N. Um, it's a little like Smith in Vietnam, I'm so I'm told, like it's a, a, something like 40 to 50% of the population have Nguyen in their name. It's also the name of one of the, the ruling dynasties in Vietnam that, that ruled most of southern Vietnam for, for uh, quite a long quite a long period of time, 400 years or so. It would be like you know how the you know the, the British royal family their their last name for real is is Windsor, and it would be like well their last name is Windsor, but also about half the country is also named Windsor. So so the first sort of moment that we're going to talk about here really is uh, involves this particular individual and his name is Alexander de Rhodes. He was a Jesuit priest who was born in 1593 at Avignon where the, the popes had had their seat for a while after they were turfed out of Rome. Uh, and he came to the southern part of Vietnam to begin with in 1624 and started proselytizing. This was a period when there were a lot of Catholic missionaries around in East Asia. It was a period when the uh, Japanese Tokugawa rulers had decided that they were going to try and, and blunt Western influence. So they expelled all the Catholics. So the, the, the Catholic missionaries were going around looking for other places that they could proselytize. And one place that they uh, ended up in was Vietnam. Rhodes is a really fascinating figure. He ended up staying he he was sort of ran into real opposition to him trying to spread catholicism in the southern part of vietnam he ended up going up to the sort of northern part staying for about 10 years until he was finally expelled from the country and i think he died at isfahan in persia in 1660 or so but rhodes was a really influential figure he learned vietnam he said that at the beginning vietnamese the language vietnamese uh, sounded kind of like the twittering of birds but he very quickly learned it to the point that he could give uh, many hundreds of sermons. And he also came up with a, a Latinized alphabet for uh, written Vietnamese. Prior to this point, you'll see on the left here, Vietnamese had been written in a set of characters called Chunam, which were simplified Han Chinese characters. The influence of Chinese characters in East Asia generally just illustrates the, the wide influence of, of Chinese culture. It's as far as I'm aware, I believe that the Japanese is, is written in multiple sets of characters, but one of them is, is, is sort of simplified Chinese characters, as far as I know, although other people, real specialists might possibly correct me about that. But the, uh, the Rhodes came up with this, this westernized system of writing called Kwak Nu. And you can see it has a lot of sort of uh, diacritical marks and other marks. Vietnamese is a sort of more tonal language than English is. So like the meaning of words, a lot of times my, my office mate who spoke Vietnamese told me that this was the case, that a lot of times what, what you're trying to say differs by the, you know, you can say the same words but mean something completely different uh, because of the tonality that you add to them. Um, but de Rhodes had the experience of meeting with real hostility, especially in the, in the, in the more southern uh, part of Vietnam that was controlled by the, the Nguyen, uh, Nguyen kings, uh, the Nguyen dynasty. And it illustrates something about Vietnam, which is that there was a sort of a suspicion of a hostility toward 
foreigners that really bordered on xenophobia. And you can kind of understand why when you look uh, at the map of where Vietnam is situated, let me get back to here. This is the sort of two parts of Vietnam, the southern part uh, running from where Dong Hoi is uh, down to the Mekong Delta in the south, and then the northern part uh, centered on the uh, Red River Valley coming down out of China. The Viet people apparently, so there's been human settlements in Vietnam for about 20,000 years. They found archeological evidence dating back 20,000 years, but the Viet people, as, as far as I can tell, I've read a number of sources on this topic. It's, it's a little like equivocal, but that they came down out of Guangxi province in China, which is just a, a kind of Northwest of, of where the Northern border is. And they had been a part of a kingdom that was called Nam Viet, which, which comprised Guangxi, but also a number of the other provinces around it and uh, was a, an area of mixed, mixed settlement. That is say Chinese, also Viet. The Viet call themselves, I believe the Kin, K-I-N-H. Um, I've, I've never, it's, it's a little unclear to me from, from my reading exactly like how that works, but they do see themselves as a sort of definite ethnic group. And, and you know, this makes a certain kind of sense too. If you look at, I'm gonna jump forward because I got this in a slightly wrong order. So this is the Han uh, dynasty and you can see down at the, at the very bottom, Vietnam and the kind of overlap into Vietnam. The Han uh, dynasty actually invaded Vietnam in about 111 BC and stayed for about a thousand years on and off. Um, and this, this very much influenced the mindset of the Vietnamese people. And I will just point out, so at, at times here, there's gonna be some very blunt language and I'm gonna use some now, but this is a, this is a, a well-known thing that Ho Chi Minh, the leader of the Chinese communists or the leader of the Vietnamese communists said, uh, when he was debating with some visitors about whether it was who the real enemy was. This was in the early 1950s. And he said, for myself, I would rather sniff a little French shit for five years uh, than eat Chinese shit for the rest of my life. And this, this I'm, I'm, it's, it's not entirely clear to me from things I've read whether he actually said this, but it was clearly a sentiment that was in his head and the head of a lot of uh, Vietnamese people. The prospect, I mean, there was a, there was a sort of belief among the leadership of, of China for, for a long period of time that Vietnam was the sort of southernmost province of China. And the, the Vietnamese fought very hard on a number of occasions to try and stop that from being the case. One of the most famous instances of this is the rebellion that was led by two uh, women, the Trung sisters, uh, this went on between the year 40 and the year 43 uh, in the common era. They were members of a kind of sub ethnic subgroup, the Lac. Uh, they were from an area, a district near Hanoi. The older one, uh, Trung Trak, she was the older one. Her husband had been somehow wronged by the Chinese authorities and she uh, and her sister Trung Ni uh, rose up in rebellion. They ended up going up into Guangxi and, and capturing quite a large area of land before the sort of the Han government finally mobilized in 42 AD or 42 CE, we call it the common era now, um, to try and, and, and turf them out. They were finally uh, defeated. The, there's, a, there's an enormous mythology around the Trung sisters. And you know one, one point uh, about this is that Madame Nu, the famous uh, wife of No Din Nu, uh, who was always doing kinds of uh, very showy, self-promoting things, uh, had a sort of statue of herself made at one point in which it was very clear, according to a number of reporters who saw it, that she was trying to sort of have herself embodied as, a, as one of the Trung sisters. It's in the mythology of the Trung sisters, they, seeing that defeat was imminent, uh, committed suicide rather than be captured by the Chinese. Apparently, from several sources that I've read, that's actually, in fact, not true. That They were just captured and executed by the Chinese and their heads were sent back to the, to the capital. But the Trung sisters are one of the sort of, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, 
it's, it's hard to think of, of, of an American cognate if you're not from the South and don't want to sort of talk about Robert E. Lee. I mean, it's kind of like George Washington, you know, the myths about George Washington and the cherry tree, like it's, they really occupy this very profound place in the sort of national cultural history of the Vietnamese. And, and when you know about this, it sort of illustrates, you know, one degree to which the, or one of the sort of elements of Vietnamese anti-foreigner sentiment, if you will. I mean, it's not, and not unreasonably so, right? Because the Chinese um, really did really express a kind of uh, practical domination of the country until the, until the 10th century, uh, when they were finally uh, turfed out as the, as the, uh, they were, the Chinese were undergoing some imperial difficulties of their own and were finally sort of pushed out by domestic Vietnamese opposition. There was a, there was a sort of interregnum period between about 905 and 938 in which the, the country was sort of uh, run by a number of sort of, there was a kind of struggle for power going on. Um, something that is, is worth sort of pointing out too, this is, a, this is a map here that has the various ethnic groups that you'll find in Vietnam and also Cambodia or Laos. One of the interesting things is the, sort of the construction of the states in this area. Well, there are two interesting things. One is that Vietnam, as we'll sort of come to discover in a few minutes here, uh, was divided for a sort of, for a long period of time. I mean, and this, this would have been interesting to sort of make part of a discussion of how uh, Vietnam was going to be governed after the, the end of the French War in China in 1954. Uh, you know, there were people saying, oh, you know, we can't, we can't split up the country. Well, it's not like the country had never been split up before. In fact, it had spent quite a long time uh, in a sort of divided situation. And we'll get to exactly how and why in, in a few minutes here. But uh, another thing that you may notice is that so there are the Lao people over in Laos. Laos was one of these countries that was kind of, in the, as, as sort of colonialism uh, broke down, was, was the sort of the state of Laos was, was kind of created. And in fact, as I understand, when the state of Laos was created, more Lao people actually lived outside the borders of, of Laos than actually lived inside it. But that, that was not an, un, not an unheard of situation throughout throughout the sort of end of colonialism. Generally, a lot of times the borders were just drawn um, because they work for whatever, you know, colonizing or decolonizing power rather than because they made sense vis-a-vis -vis the facts on the ground. So there were a number of important cultural effects that arose from the Chinese domination of or involvement in Vietnam. Uh, one of them was, uh, well, uh, the influence of Confucianism. Now. Buddhism came to Vietnam relatively early on as well and would play a, a very spectacular role uh, once the, once the uh, U.S. war in Vietnam really got going. But Confucianism was imported by the Chinese and very much took root throughout the governing classes of Vietnam. Uh, Confucianism is not really a religion. It's, it has a kind of a kind of structural view of the way the world is, very top-down uh, authoritarian view. It's all, there's, there's a very pronounced dimension of uh, respect for elders. And it involved the sort of creation of a class of highly educated, in most cases, bureaucrats or mandarins who would run the country, who would maintain the institutions of the state. And the, one of the key features of Confucianism was, I mean, it wasn't a sort of high in the sky when you die type of operation. I mean, it was very, Confucianism very, you know, not, not terribly concerned with, with questions of the afterlife. What the sort of main virtue from the Confucian perspective is, is proper organization in this life. And that had a, had a very profound effect on the, on the structure of Vietnamese society, uh, even up into the even up into the period after the French arrived, and even after we did, this is by the way another map. Uh, this is from 1970, but it shows the sort of various ethno linguistic groups in Vietnam, and what you can kind of see is the sort of coastal strip where the the sort of Viet uh, group is more prominent. But once you get into the sort of you can see the Khmer 
speakers in, in Cambodia down in the sort of Southwest. But what you can kind of see is once you get up into the mountains, the sort of mountainous, the ranges of mountains that, that, that go across the border of uh, Western Cambodia or Eastern Cambodia, Eastern Laos, Western uh, Vietnam, what you find is uh, a, a myriad of uh, smaller ethnic groups, some of which both the French and the United States tried to exploit uh, against the communists, uh, sometimes to good effect, sometimes less so. This is also the area from which a lot of the uh, opium comes and uh, it gets transformed in various places in this area to uh, into heroin, which became a really very profound problem during the during the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. There's a really interesting book by a guy named uh, Apoy called The Politics of Heroin that um, really extensively researched and it, and it illustrates a lot of the ways that the, the war in Vietnam, the French and then the U.S. war in Vietnam kind of overlapped an already existing sort of trade in heroin, heroin in various states of production. Another thing that's worth knowing about Vietnam, and, and, and this will become important later on, is that so there's a very strong rural-urban divide. Uh, the peasantry tends to be like peasantry in, in most places, very inward-looking, very conservative. The primary crop is wet rice cultivation. The real breadbasket of the country, if you will, I mean, maybe rice basket would be a better, would be a more appropriate term, is in the South, especially in the Mekong Delta. The North, especially the Red River Valley, has tended to be less food rich and in fact has been often been subject to famines over the course of the centuries since, since Vietnam was settled. And this, this turned into, you know, the, the, the fact that, that food was, was relatively easy to come by in the South made it much more difficult for the, the government to suppress the guerrilla movement. A little bit more about that in talk number three, but what's what's interesting is that, and what would come to, to play a really important role is the fact that in the countryside the religion tends to be uh, animist and tends to also be very much about ancestor worship, and so it's important to be near and to be able to tend the graves of one's ancestors for, in terms of what's going to happen to one in the afterlife. This is sort of one of those places at which kind of Confucianism, which is the kind of like ethos of the upper crust of society, runs afoul of the, or not runs afoul, but but sort of doesn't, doesn't exist in parallel with a kind of lower or belief that, that's belief systems that are more common in the lower orders of society, um, so to speak. Uh, in 1407, the Chinese in the, the Ming, the, this point, the Ming Dynasty uh, invaded, occupied the country until 1427. Uh, a rebellion got started under uh, a local official from an area called Lansan, a town called Lansan, Li Loi. They eventually uh, managed to push the Chinese out uh, after about 10 years of nine years of fighting. And uh, Li Loi established a dynasty which lasted on and off until the beginning of the 19th century, although after a certain point, it was really more nominal than anything else. The, once the, the sort of the first era of the Li dynasty came to grief, if you will, uh, it, was, it was surpassed by other dynasties. I won't, I won't list the names because the, the point is just the sort of the number of them rather than, the, uh, rather than who they were. But, uh, the Li emperors did carry out land reforms. They did try to make the economy work better. They, uh, there was a constant struggle going on at this time between Confucianism and Buddhism. One sort of interesting thing about both Confucianism and Buddhism is that they're not really, they're very kind of now centered belief systems. Neither one of them, some versions of Buddhism have a kind of like metaphysical uh, dimension to them, but a lot of Buddhism, a lot of, there's, there's, there's many sort of strands of Buddhism. Buddhism tends to be more about the kind of here and now in the same way that Confucianism does. 
Vietnam was uh, in an interesting place uh, in this period and, 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 their, and their place became even more interesting, so to speak, because they were kind of along the line of European uh, attempts to not only explore, but to find spices. I mean, once the, the Europeans got going with the spice trade, they realized there was huge amounts of money to be made such that you could send, I mean, an, an indication of how much money could be made in, in the spice trade uh, can be seen in the fact that, you know, they were willing to send ships down around the, uh, the, the southern coast of Africa through the Indian Ocean in a very long and, and perilous journey. But the, the fact of the matter is that, that just fabulous wealth could be made. And at this time, the, it was sort of in the, in the 16th century, was the era in which the Portuguese particularly started colonizing. They, they put in a trading station at Macau, which if you look at this map is kind of a little ways up the, the coast uh, from where the big island of Hainan is. But one of the sort of main things that happened during the Li dynasty, uh, and it's kind of, it was, it was kind of overthrown by a family called Mok in 1527. Uh, and then after that, two competing dynasties are formed, one in the north, the Trin, and one sort of further south of the Nguyen. Um, at this time, too, it's worth you can sort of see from this map, the, the southern part of Vietnam in this map, you can sort of see there's the Khmer, which is the sort of proto-Cambodian people. And then along the coast in, in what's modern-day Vietnam, the Champa civilization, which was a, a civilization in, influenced by Indian culture, and you can kind of see their capital at Vijaya. That's that's a very sort of Indian sounding name. And it's it wasn't until uh, the sort of rise of the Nguyen dynasty in the south, uh, which which was sort of centered on the, the central coast of Vietnam, that the that the Champa civilization was 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 pretty comprehensively destroyed, although Cham people still were in central Vietnam uh, after this period. The Trin took in, in, in practice like actual power in the north away from the Mok in the, in the 1540s. The Nguyen, because who were also a sort of powerful family, decided that it was possible that the Trin were going to try and wipe them out. So they moved further south. I think 1600 is the actual sort of start date of the official Nguyen dynasty in the southern part of Vietnam. In 1771, uh, and I know this is sort of jumping a ways, but, but uh, this is, I think, the sort of more key feature that we need to know about. A rebellion starts in Tessan that eventually, the Trinh and the Nguyen had been at war for a lot of the 17th century between 1627 and 1672. But the Taysan Rebellion essentially tried to sort of take power from the Nguyen and then were eventually defeated by the Nguyen who uh, reasserted their power after 1802. It's during this period that French colonialism starts to really get going in Vietnam. The French were relatively late comers, although there had been some you know, we, we saw Alexander de Rode is there in 1624, but he's really there as an emissary of the Pope, not quite so much as an emissary of the French. Probably, you know, it's, it's, it's worth sort of pointing out that he's a Jesuit and a lot of the missionaries were Jesuits. And the, the first thing, the first thing that, that government's trying to sort of like reduce the power of the Pope in whatever state tended to do was expel the Jesuits. So the Jesuits were always in a kind of like complex uh, relationship with European governments. But it's not until the late 18th century that the uh, French start moving into Vietnam. They start trying to create, create uh, trading bases in the southern part of Vietnam. Mostly these kind of fizzle. The Dutch East India Company did too. And they fizzled mostly because of the hostility of the locals. It's not until the middle of the 19th century when the French start moving for real into Vietnam so this is the Cham, this map on the left is the Cham. What we can kind of see is in this sort of southern part of Vietnam, it doesn't even really extend down to, doesn't really extend down to where Saigon is uh, until, until later on to the, the beginning of the 19th century. 
in the middle of the 19th century, the French start moving into Vietnam in a big way. They send a naval expedition that first bombards uh, Da Nang in 1858 and then moves south to seize Saigon in 1859. After a series of uh, struggles with the, uh, I mean, sort of like the, the, the way to look at this is <clears throat> what almost invariably happened was uh, Catholic missionaries would be attacked or banned. Sometimes Catholic missionaries uh, were involved in, in political struggles within Vietnam. And the French government would be called in to defend them. Well, finally, they, I mean, for a long time, they thought, well, there isn't, there isn't much there isn't much to be made of this. There was a sort of famous expedition uh, led by a guy named Garnier that went up the, went up the Mekong River uh, in the hopes that they would find a sort of way, southern way into China. And that was really what they were focused on was there was trying to sort of find a way to economically access China. And they, they found out that the, the Mekong River was really not navigable. But they made a large circle and came back down the Red River and discovered that the Red River was a good way to access Guangxi province in southern China. Uh, and so a lot of the French efforts in the 1860s are really devoted to uh, trying to expand a kind of trading presence in Vietnam. And they end up finally seizing large portions of Vietnam, which they divided three sections. You can kind of see this is the sort of a map that shows, the map on the left shows the French uh, taking over Annam, this kind of central point, central uh, section in 1883 and 84. In 84, 1884, they also take power in uh, Tonkin, which is the sort of northern segment of Vietnam. Uh, earlier on, they'd taken power in what they called Cochin China, which is the, the area around Saigon and south into the Mekong Delta. The French also assert power in 1867 in Cambodia, Slightly later uh, into the Lao Highlands, you can see like you know all the area up to the up to the Chinese border. And you can see in this map on the right, Tonkin up in the north, Annam, which is that kind of central area of China, and Cochin China in the south. The French colonial efforts generally were undertaken under the aegis of something they like to call the Mission Civilisatrice, the civilizing mission. And this was this guided their actions in in Asia, uh, in South Asia and India, and in large sections of Africa. And the thing to think about when you hear a, a term like the Mission Civilisatrice, the civilizing mission is, well, one premise of this, right, is that the people that you're dealing with must be uncivilized. And so what you're doing is trying to bring civilization to them. So uh, school children, uh, I believe this was the case in Vietnam. I know that it was the case in Algeria and Morocco. School children in French run schools studied in the 19th century from a textbook, the title of which was Our Ancestors the Gauls, which is makes sense if you're from, you know, Paris, makes less sense if you're from Fez or you know, anywhere in Algeria or anywhere else that's not metropolitan France. But also the, the civilizing mission was a bit disingenuous. The French were really interested in making money. Their colonialism could be extremely brutal. It probably in most places didn't reach the level of brutality that the Belgians exerted in the Congo where they were hacking off people's limbs at a mile a minute. But it was, it was uh, quite, quite brutal and oppressive. Uh, the French wanted to uh, economically exploit Vietnam. The main thing they, they wanted to exploit it for, one of the big ones was uh, rubber. Any of you who've seen the, uh, the recut version of Apocalypse Now, you know, there's that long scene where the, the guys from the boat are sitting around in a French rubber plantation. It's probably for the best that it was cut because it was sort of bogged down the movie, but, but it was nonetheless a kind of interesting illustration of what the French were really there to do. The French set up a system of government, a system of schools that were meant to kind of constantly reinscribe the superiority of French culture over Vietnamese culture. And one of the interesting things too is the way that French culture became, or the French language particularly became imbricated in Vietnamese culture. So that if you read, I was just reading Stanley Carnow's book on the, the history of Vietnam. Stanley Carnow was a US uh, reporter who, uh, 
went to Vietnam in the 1950s uh, and stayed there through the, the bulk of the war, or was there on and off, I guess. But, you know, he's constantly mentioning, you know, he'd be interviewing these guys like Bo Nguyen Jap, the great North Vietnamese general, or, or Phan Van Dong, the head of the government. And they could just speak absolutely perfect Lycee French, we say. And they, you know, they kind of had a love-hate relationship with it. Carnell relates this story where he's talking to some Vietnamese official, of sort of like who had, who, had, who had been there through the Vietnam and Vietnam period and, and had and spoke quite excellent French. And the guy said to him, I'm glad you speak the language of civilization, which is kind of an ironic thing to say. But, uh, and who knows if they actually said it. But it does sort of illustrate the way that uh, French culture did influence Vietnam. Um, the French kind of kept the, the Nguyen rulers around uh, because it made it sort of easier to make things look uh, legitimate. When the Second World War broke out, the Vichy government, once France fell, uh, made it clear to the Japanese that they wouldn't provide much resistance and the Japanese invaded in 1940. And for a lot of people who would later fight in the Vietnamese resistance, uh, against the French and later against us, this was a really key moment because all of a sudden you went from the situation in which white people were obviously superior and treated everybody uh, who was Asian as a kind of second class citizen at best to a situation in which the Asians were in control. Now it turned out that the Japanese had a lot in common with the French in the sense that they really wanted to exploit the country too. The, sort of the Japanese liked to sort of designate their, their sort of the possessions they were acquiring in the, in the late 1930s and early 1940s in, in East Asia as the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Zone, which made it seem like we're all going to be part of where they were all going to be part of some like uh, great commonwealth when in fact it was, it was a very top-down Japanese-run type of operation. Uh, one of the things that the Japanese really wanted from Vietnam was rice, Rice had always been in a little bit of short supply since the, since the 19th century because the French were constantly uh, exporting it. So the level of malnutrition, especially in the North, was, was quite widespread. The uh, Chinese exported rice quite extensively, such that uh, in 1944 and 1945, a famine broke out. Probably between 600,000 and 2 million people died. And this really soured Vietnamese people on the whole Japanese and even Patient. But one thing that happened was that Vietnamese nationalist groups, among them the groups that would sort of coalesce into the Viet Minh later on in the, when, the, when the French came back in the 1950s, engaged in a lot of kind of like actions to try and make rice available to people. And, and this sort of created a kind of positive feeling among a lot of Vietnamese people toward these nationalist groups, uh, the, Viet, the sort of precursor of the Viet Minh a group that went by the initials of the VNQDD, uh, which we'll get, get into in a little greater detail in later talks. But the sort of, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of the kind of prehistory is Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was born under the name Nguyen Sin Kung in 1890 in a village called uh, Huang Tru. We think 1890, although he gave several at different times, he said 1891 or 1892 or 1894, but it doesn't. His father was a sort of low-level official. He eventually did some school, did some school teaching. Eventually, his father lost his job because he dealt out some punishment, I think, I think a whipping type punishment to somebody who eventually died from it. And his father was, was punished for that, which is sort of an odd situation since normally the, the sort of he was he was a low-level Mandarin, but he was a Mandarin. He eventually uh, applied to a French colonial school for officials who were meant to sort of work in the colonies. He, uh, but his, his application was rejected. So he, after a while, took ship in uh, 1911. He sailed uh, first to France. Then he spent some time in Great Britain. Uh, he spent some time in India. He spent some time in New York. Apparently he was quite fascinated by the, by the scene in New York, um, not surprisingly. But then he ends up settling in France and gets involved not only in the kind of like French literary culture, but also in the Vietnamese nationalist movement 
in France. He takes part in the conference that results in the founding of the uh, French Communist Party. And this is a sort of interesting thing about Ho Chi Minh, Nguyen Sinh Kung, who at this time was calling himself Nguyen I Quoc, which means Nguyen, Nguyen the Patriot. He tried to make representations to Wilson during the Versailles Conference at the end of the First World War. To try and, you know, he was like, yeah, you know, we're, you know, you talked about the 14 points and, uh, you know, self-determination of the subject peoples and, you know, gee, wouldn't that be great for Vietnam? Uh, Wilson refuses to see him or I, I don't even think Wilson knew that he was trying to see him. I think that, that other people prevented him from seeing Wilson because really, uh, and this is a theme that would, that would prove to be of profound importance later on, what the United States didn't necessarily want to do was be alienating European powers with whom they would have to work uh, in the process of reconfiguring European society in the wake of the in the wake of the First World War. But so he uh, is attends in December 1920 the Congress of Tours, the French Socialist Party Congress of Tours, at which the Communist Party breaks off. So. The question of Ho Chi Minh's communism is an important. There's an OSS operator named Archimedes, Archimedes Patty who worked with Ho Chi Minh in the, uh, when he was sort of uh, fighting as a guerrilla against the Japanese uh, during the Second World War. And he, uh, you can see here, by the way, this is Ho Chi Minh uh, standing uh, among what was a group that were called the Deer Mission, who was a sort of OSS French joint operation in the highlands of Vietnam. And during this period, he was constantly trying to court the support of the US government because he figured that the United States was the most likely group to, with whom the Vietnamese could ally to get their, get their independence. You can see uh, just, to the, just to the right of Ho Chi Minh is Bo Nguyen Zap, the, who would later become the general uh, leading general of the North Vietnamese, Viet Minh, during the French period, he was the architect of the Viet Minh victory at uh, Dien Bien Phu, which was the sort of the catastrophic defeat that, that, that was the precursor for the French departure from Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh's forces in the mountains, once again, were constantly trying to sort of put together connections to the Americans. They would rescue down flyers and, and return them to uh, U.S. forces. And uh, there's a sort of later point uh, at which when, the, when things were starting to really break down with the French, that an American officer was, ex was killed in an ambush in 1945 in Saigon. And um, Ho Chi Minh sent this personal letter of apology to, to Truman to try, and sort of, uh, to try and sort of smooth it over. So I'll just say Archimedes Patty said, you, you, you see the, there's an interview piece with him that's in the first big Vietnam documentary, which was done by PBS in the early 1980s, Vietnam and Television History. I, I really recommend both that and the Ken Burns. I think they're both very good. General uh, William Westmoreland sued PBS after the first one because he thought he came off rather badly. I, I don't think that he necessarily came off any worse than, than probably he merited, but but there's a really interesting interview with Archimedes Patty where he says about Ho Chi Minh, you know, he was a nationalist first and he probably thought that, you know, communism was probably the best system for Vietnam, but he was anxious to work with us. And probably we could have come to some sort of modus vivendi with him, but this is a time when uh, anti-communism and the fear that communism is spreading is the most profound operative factor in U.S. and European governing circles. I mean, this is really the, the thing that, that, that becomes sort of clearest feature of U.S. international relations thinking, even by 1943. I mean, even by 1943, the U.S. government is saying, well, the Hitler regime is probably not gonna last that much longer and, and what's the problem going to be? What's the main problem going to be once the Hitler regime goes away? Well, it's going to be communism. So because Ho Chi Minh had been associated with the communists, he had been once again a member of the French Communist Party. He had spent a decade in Russia and China 
uh, in the 30s before infiltrating back into Vietnam. The feeling was that the US government needed to find someone and the French government, who they were sort of helping at that point, needed to find someone of a, of a nationalist and anti-communist caste, and, and that was just not Ho Chi Minh. Who it was, we'll, we'll talk about in more detail uh, in, the next, in the next lecture, but I will just say that, uh, so I worked with a guy for a couple of years when I was at the University of Washington who had been a colonel in the, in the Arvin in the South Vietnamese Air Force. And Dung was a really great guy. He had spent about eight years in a, in a North Vietnamese re-education camp after the war. So not surprisingly, he had some very pronounced negative feelings towards Ho Chi Minh and everyone associated with him. And I, I, I 100% do not blame him. He was treated, I think, quite, quite horribly. But he, you know, I, I broached this idea to him and he was like, he thought that was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. No, you know, he was always a communist. He's a very convinced communist. But I think it's at least arguable. And I think that if you look at what the OSS people who work with him had to say, that he probably, we probably could have found a way to work with him. But in the moment, you know, we had two main goals. One was we wanted to, we wanted not to disempower France. We knew that France needed to be part of the post-war rebuilding of Europe uh, in the wake of the Second World War and anti-communism. And anti-communism is absolutely central to U.S. thinking about East Asia and also about, also about Europe. I mean, one of the number one fears that was coursing through American governing circles in the 1940s and the, the, the reason for the Marshall Plan. I mean, you can just, it's, it's very straightforward. They were afraid that communism would look like a good system if capitalism wasn't gonna get it done. And so the US government was willing to spend, you know, millions and millions of dollars on the Marshall Plan to try and make European economies work. Well, why did they wanna do that? It wasn't necessarily out of a sense of out, pure altruism, it never is, it was because they were afraid that the worse things looked in France under liberal capitalism, the better communism would look. And I mean, okay, things have to look pretty bad for communism, especially if the Stalinist variety and it'll look like a good idea. But in those days, you know, the, the stock of the communists was relatively high because they had been instrumental, you know, they had stopped the Nazis at Stalingrad. They had like expended lots of blood, lots of equipment to defeat Hitler, I mean, the, you know, it's, it's funny when we look at the Second World War and, and our role of it, we obviously like, you know, we, we, we played a very important role. You know, I have a very, I look back, you know, with, in, with awe at the, at the efforts of American soldiers in the Second World War, not the least of which because my grandfather was one of them. But the, the Soviets think that, or I mean, the Russians think that our view about it is funny because, you know, you know, between three and 500,000 Americans died, which is a lot, but more than 20 million Russians died. I mean, the, you know, really, see, if you look at the, look at it from their perspective, they were like, well, we beat Hitler. And then later on, toward the end, you guys did D-Day and whatever else. Which, thanks. But let's be clear about what, what actually happened. So in 1945, we're in a situation in which the Vietnamese have been in the process of they think they're now going to get out from under the thumb of the Chinese or of the of the uh, Japanese. There's a there's a nationalist Chinese army operating in in northern Vietnam, and the Vietnamese are very nervous about that because when the when the Chinese come, they tend to stay for a long time. Uh, historically speaking, and here come the French back in, and the 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 Allies, the British, who are the who are the sort of people on the ground start saying, well, okay, so we're gonna turn over power to the French. And by the way, <clears throat> all these Japanese who've surrendered, all these Japanese soldiers, we're gonna sort of like use them as a kind of administrative force while we're in the process of turning power back over to uh, the Vietnamese or the, the French. And so what you get is a very tense and explosive situation in which the Vietnam Vietnamese had hoped that the, the sort of the destruction of uh, the Japanese colonial empire was going to result in their finally getting this national liberation, which 
sort of looked at from the perspective of their culture, they'd been fighting for, you know, for almost 2000 years. And here come the Europeans again saying, well, no, like this is our, you know, we hold legitimate government over you. And if you don't like it, we're going to sort of reassert our power by force. And so the U.S. becomes committed to the project of reasserting French hegemony in Vietnam, in Indochina, as it was still called in those days. The whole country was called Indochina, um, at least in sort of like governmental shorthand. And now we see the kind of roots, the longer roots of a situation in which, you know, these facts about there, there can't have been more than a handful of scholars of Vietnamese history in the United States at the time, or probably hardly none. So we're kind of going on the kind of French understanding of what's going on in the country, right? And what we get is the United States increasingly brought in by the French into a conflict uh, in the area, which they don't necessarily want to be in, but in which they sort of feel like they have to help stand up for their ally, the French, our ally, the French, and in which they kind of feel like, you know, I mean, there's a, let's, let's, let's be clear, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a race element to it too. Like, you know, most Americans look at a Frenchman and they look at a Vietnamese, who do they immediately think is like more similar? Well, if it's a sort of metropolitan white Frenchman, you know, Americans are going to look at them and say, well, they're, you know, kind of like us, basically, whereas like the, the Vietnamese are different. They have a language that's, you know, a culture that's very different from ours. So it was a very sort of comfortable move for the United States to try and buck up the French, try and get in on the side of the French, even if they didn't exactly understand the sort of whys and wherefores of what the French uh, French involvement in Indochina was going to be about. So uh, that's basically where we're at. We're going to leave it in 1945. For right now, we're going to come back on uh, May the 6th and uh, talk about the what's often called the first Indochina war. Of course, Europeans think that, you know, all the other wars that happened there are not, you know, less relevant. But uh, if anybody has questions, I'm certainly willing to uh, answer them to the best of my abilities. Oh, sorry, one other thing. This presentation will be up, uh, comments on the, when the talk gets posted. I try and put some like, some further reading type stuff. The first two books are about sort of French colonialism. They're probably not the first books. I did sort of alphabetical by author. So the place to start probably is uh, Stanley Carnow's book. Uh, it was sort of reissued fairly recently, in the 90s, I think, sometime. It's an extremely interesting book. There are some things in it that he either gets wrong or there's some things that the professor that I was working for at the, the Vietnam course, University of Washington said, he said some things that he felt were kind of, you know, not entirely racially sensitive. Uh, I leave that to you to, to determine. He's an old school reporter. It's very well written, very engaging. More recent books, Christopher Ghosh's Vietnam and New History is an absolutely fabulous book. Um, ben Kiernan's Vietnam, a history from earliest times to the present, kind of front loads a lot of the kind of earlier history. So um, if, you're, if you're more interested in the kind of more modern political history, there's, that gets into less sort of granularity with the things that, that we're interested in. But Brichot and Amory's uh, Indochina and Ambiguous Colonization is a really fascinating book, um, but probably something you should you should read if you're going to after you've read one of the the Gosha or the Karnal or whatever. <laughs>